Hello and welcome to the Page and Stage podcast, where we explore the art and craft of writing and performance. I'm your host, Jason Cannon. This podcast is made possible solely through the support of listeners like you. If you're enjoying this show, I encourage you to do two things. First, tell a friend. Word of mouth has always been and will always be the best marketing tool in the world. And second, visit pageandstage.art. That's pageandstage.art and click on support. You'll then be able to make a donation that helps cover the cost of producing this podcast or even become a backer and set up a monthly recurring donation in any amount. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your messages and encouragement. And thank you for your support. My guest today is award-winning multi-hyphenated theater artist Harrison Bryan. Harrison is a Helen Hayes-nominated actor, a playwright, a librettist, a producer, and a seriously amazing puppeteer. Harrison is a recipient of the New York Innovative Theater Award, an honoree of the American Playwright Foundation, an artist-in-residence at Windridge Farms, a fellowship theater maker with the Alliance of Jewish Theater, It is a member of the Dramatist Guild of America, Actors' Equity, and SAG-AFTRA. Try saying all of that three times fast. Harrison lives in Brooklyn and is proud to work with Faces Theater Network for Teens, using playwriting and improvisation to promote tolerance, peace, and anti-bullying. Come to this episode for the storytelling and stay for the puppets as I dig in with Harrison Bryan. I am beyond thrilled to be talking with Harris and Brian today. It's been way too long, Harrison. <laughs> Jason! <laughs> and what's so funny, you live in Brooklyn. I'm in Sarasota. We met doing a show down here, which we'll get to, but you currently are in Florida as well. Yeah, I know. We're, we're, on, we're on separate sides of the state right now. but Opposite um, coasts. I mean, uh, many things I love about this wild ride of an industry we're in, but I think the, the ability to sort of pick up my life and move to a different life at a whim is, <laughs> is, 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 is part of the charm. So I'm currently in West Palm Beach and I'm doing a production of Death of a Salesman at Palm Beach Drama Works. Drama Works, uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so I'm currently in, the, in their awesome acting housing and my roommate has left so I can be as loud as I want on the oh, podcast. Oh, great. Good, good. Um, <laughs> we, we, won't get, we won't get podcast bombed if that's even a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I've locked all the doors, Jason. It's just Perfect. us. Harrison, so on your website. There's a couple things I need to uh, dig in here with you because you are Brooklyn born and raised, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet you went to Boston University. How does like a died in the and you're a Yankees fan, right? So fun story. I'm actually I'm actually a Mets fan. Oh, you I said grew... it out loud. You are recorded I... saying it. <laughs> <laughs> it is my curse to bear. But I grew up a Yankees fan. In 1999, I saw them win their their third World Series in their in fourth year. Right. Yeah, and I got right. um to be to be very honest, I remember watch. I was I was at Game Four of the World Series in 1999 when they when they won again against the Braves. They swept. It was a terrible World Series. I mean, not if you were a Yankees fan, but at that right. time I was. I was eight years old. For the rest old. of the country, it was terrible. For the rest of the country, <laughs> right? And so I was eight years old and I remember everyone screaming like they won the World Series again and the whole stadium was so excited. My mom, bless her heart, is a huge Yankees fan and I remember sitting there being like, I'm not excited anymore. I'm bored. I'm bored by this team nonstop winning and I felt so I felt bad because my mom is like such a and it's like she raised me to be a Yankees fan and I was sitting there not happy and and i remember i had to sort of come out to my parents the next year and be like and be like parents like i have something i need to talk to you about i i I don't think i want to root for the yankees anymore i i think i want to try and root for the mets and i I, and my dad who is a closeted mets fan as well (laughs) um he was like great we'll go get tickets for shea stadium let's go see let's let's but like let's not let's not decide anything right now let's see how the whole season turns out let's and maybe you can always go back to the Yankees. They're always right there, honey. And then, <laughs> and so, of course, the year 2000 is happening, and I'm rooting for the yep. Mets the whole time. Yep. And who do the Mets play in the World yep. Series? That Subway year? Series. It's the Yankees. And I remember sitting there and watching the Mets lose, and I wasn't happy. I was upset, which confirmed that I was a self-hating Mets fan. <laughs> and, and so it all sort of came full circle right there, and that's when I decided I root for the underdog. I'm an underdog 
I'm an underdog oh, person. Underdog, and, yeah. And I, I like that about my my sports teams, and I and I just that's where I am. So uh, that's where I live. Please. And funny that I then went to Boston University because right. the last team that actually we beat for the World Series was Boston. So yep. I felt kind of at home there. I was like, all right, <laughs> this this is the one city I beat <laughs> once. Right. So that, please that's tell funny. me that that whole self-hating coming out as a Mets fan thing has made its way into a sketch or a 10 minute play because that's just dying to be like on SNL or something. <laughs> uh, hey, it, it was birthed on this podcast. We there can certainly, <laughs> I will give you a, a, a collaboration credit. There it is. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, as, as everyone heard in the intro, there's not a lot that Harrison doesn't do when it comes to like storytelling and performance and theater and you self-identify as a multi-hyphenate. Talk a little bit about where that term came from for you, what that means to you. Yeah, I've worked a lot with Jared Mazzacci, who is a multi-hyphenate in his own respect. He's a director, designer, writer, actor, performer. And um, he really introduced me to that phrase a few years ago. I've since embraced the inherent design that theater offers, which is a collaborative spirit in every sense of the word. And that doesn't just stop with how do I collaborate outside of myself, but it actually starts with how do I collaborate within myself? Because art is so personal, the craft, the creation, it is impossible to remove the I from what I create. And as a creator, as a theater artist, I am working in several disciplines to make what I make. And so the multi-hyphenate is just a reflection of not boxing my craft, my mode into one particular discipline, but allowing for all of them to exist and contribute to each other's strengths whenever possible. I would say like my playwriting really came up, came up because I found it very therapeutic to write characters and stories. And, you know, you share your work with enough people who are like, this is interesting. Keep going. You just kind of keep going. Yeah. And I think I was very lucky to be encouraged at a young age. I had a playwriting class even in high school. And I, I had some really great teachers who encouraged creative writing. And that always felt like a hobby. And then once I graduated from my acting program at, at Boston University, that hobby kind of got folded into my acting in that I would be in rehearsals and working on a play and people were like, what are you working on? Ooh, can we read it out loud? And suddenly I'm, I'm scheduling readings during my rehearsals with the <laughs> actors that I'm in the company with. And it becomes an indistinguishable reference of time where it's like, how am I how am I exerting my time? How am I managing myself as an artist so that nothing feels like nothing feels like it's on the back burner? It's all cooking at the same time. Yeah. And so when I refer to myself as a multi-hyphenate, it's because it's not about the order of which I list my creative disciplines. It's all hyphened. It's all happening collectively on the same line. It is connected. Yeah. I think I used to I used to compartmentalize all of it. I used to say, like, today I have my acting hat on, today I have my right. writing hat on, today right. I have my puppeteer hat on, today I have my producer hat on. I think that is an, un it's an unfair expectation because I only have one head. And <laughs> I, rather than buying a ton of freaking hats, I'm now adapting this sort of Sherlock Holmesian multi-brimmed hat. It's just about what I'm, I guess, in the moment leading with, but all the other stuff is still percolating and talking to each other. Yeah. Um, Front of the hat is Yankees. Back of the hat is Mets. <laughs> 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 yes, that will keep my parents very happy. Exactly. Um, I, think that's, I think that's right. And so that's sort of where I live with it. And I'm, I'm excited by it. And it feels like a lot of artists and actors and writers, directors, designers, it seems like we are in a bit of a renaissance in that even though there's more competition, and I use competition in air quotes because yeah. like we're, <laughs> we're all in the same boat. We all yeah. got to swim. We all got to learn to swim together here. Yep. And there are a limited amount of opportunities. There's also now more than ever so many to opportunities. Self, to self-generate opportunities. And to, yeah. Yes. 
And so I'm surrounded by a lot more of these multi-hyphenates than I've ever been. And it's really exciting to sort of just bounce off of each other and share resources, strengths, and get better at the things that we want to get better at. And just keep adding, just keep adding to the toolbox. We talk about toolboxes all the time as actors. Yep. And it's like our toolbox. We are actually, <laughs> we are Home Depot. We are no longer, <laughs> we are no longer just carrying a toolbox. We are or the a, whole store. We are the department store. And what a, what an amazing opportunity to continue to grow in that respect. I think this is a fantastic way to think about storytelling in general and storytelling as a mechanic. It just works because it works, right? That is the singular thing, but there are so many ways to express it. Just this morning, for example, I was whipping up a new bio for the show that I'm going to have up in New York this summer. And I had to ask the PR person, what what kind of bio do you want? Who is it for? Just like you, I'm sure you have a million different bios on your computer Mm -hmm. in a file, right? And it's, it's like, well, am I the actor in this show? What does the audience want to know about me in this particular Mm. context of this particular project at this particular time? And okay, I can provide you that bio because we can't provide the entire 8,000 word bio for every single project. You got to boil that down to 300 words. So there's a chance there then to get specific inside this largesse you're talking about. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really interested and I'm, I'm more and more curious in how they speak to each other. And I think you have to always know your audience. You have to always know like, and also just as like, as a freelancer, I am often employed. So, right. you know, when I'm, when in I am. In a specific lane, right. Yes. When I'm on stage in Death of a Salesman here, like they're not interested in my author notes right. for Arthur Miller, you know. And, and uh, maybe and Harrison, it, leave the puppet at home for Death of a Salesman. Yeah, it's not that yes. kind of show. <laughs> it's not that kind of show. And so I think it's really important to establish clear communication and boundaries and expectations when you're in processes where you are not like spearheading it. Inside of that, and this is where I go back to like, what is my internal collaboration? Yes. Because when I am in performance, I am no longer just looking at it from where do I fit into this show as an actor, but as I am acting in it, my writer hat is spinning and I say, what is the playwright's intention in this scene and how does it connect to the scene before and after, which is dramaturgical work that we do as actors all the time. I just never thought about it as a writing tool as well. So then when I'm sitting down and I'm writing a play and I'm like, what does this scene need? Sometimes my acting brain is spinning and it's like, well, if I was performing in this, what are the questions I would ask as an actor? And then I'm, and so I'm asking these questions from different lens and viewpoints and that's just opening up my world. And um, so I'm, I'm way more interested and curious in that than compartmentalizing anymore. Yeah. When I teach playwriting and students will come up with like to a, a, like one of those juicy speeches, it's the aria. It's the the hero finally claims his love or reveals the secret or it's the juicy speech, right? It's the mm. it's the Oscar winning moment, right? When they show the clip on the t- it's that speech. And if they're struggling with it, I'll do, I'll do exactly what you said, Harris, and I'll ask the playwright, "Hey, if you were the actor in this, how would you want it to go?" Mm. As an actor, you want that speech just to feel like honey in your mouth. You want you want the speech to lift you like a you know you're on a surfboard on a huge yeah. wave. And if you can bring that, oh oh, as the playwright, I'm overanalyzing. How do I write it in such a way that my actor will love me forever? <laughs> yes, yes. I often say like if it's if it doesn't feel fun to perform, yeah. if it's not gonna bring if it's not gonna bring me as an actor joy, then I wanna relook at this language. I wanna relook at this character because I'm not just putting something on paper, I'm trying to bring something to life. So I've been really inspired by that. You've talked a couple of times about collaborating with yourself, Harrison, and I mm. I'm I think and push back if I'm off here, but you on your website, you also kind of, uh, I call it almost a personal personal mission statement. In your bio, you say something about doing work that promotes tolerance, peace, and anti-bullying. And I'm wondering if, if that personal mission, if that motor, if that spiritual component is akin to this collaboration with self, if the thing that ties all your different hats together is this mission, this idea of tolerance, peace, and anti-bullying, is that, am I kind of pinpointing what kind of makes you tick? Hmm. Or have you even thought of it that way? I love, I have not. That's really interesting. And I think our, as artists, our subconscious is always at play. I think we're always, 
we're always kind of dreaming as we create. And so it doesn't surprise me that as I try and accept myself internally in all of these capacities, it speaks to the themes of what I try and project into the world as what, as my values, both creatively and just humanitarily. So that's really interesting. And this is, again, like, it's an interpretive art form. Like, and this is why we can't, we cannot separate ourselves from the art that we create. And right. even when we are, even when we are writing characters who are different than us, who maybe identify different than us, it is still somewhat a part of us and our experience. So that doesn't surprise me. I think like if I were to fully missionary style my missionary <laughs> statement here, I would probably, I would probably quote one of my favorite Charlie Chaplin quotes. I believe in the power of laughter and tears as an antidote to hatred and terror. It stems upon the idea that everything I try and bring into this world is an aid to humor, like using humor to connect ourselves to the desire to wake up every day and grow and learn and be a better person. Yeah. Um, I think nothing, nothing I ever bring in this world no matter how dramatic of a scene I'm in or no matter how tragic a play that I bring to the surface, I think it has to have some kind of humor. And so that's, that's, a, big, that's a big win for me. Yeah, that's one of my favorite Shaw quotes. The, the truth is the funniest joke in the world. Yes, that's right. When I feel myself getting too precious in my work, I just have to remind myself of that. The truth is always funnier. The truth is always weirder. The truth is always scarier. The truth is always more dramatic. I don't have to make it up. I just have to skillfully reflect it. And that's why Shakespeare had all of those fools. Yeah. Oh, the, my the goodness. truth bearers, right? I mean, the, the people who are looking at the world through a slightly askew lens to comment on the absurdities of yeah. life. And you look at those characters. <laughs> so I feel like that's that. <laughs> so I, I, I'm so in that world. I'm so in that mode. And as we, yeah, as we try to take what we do with the utmost reverence and care and seriousness, like, yeah, we, we can't lose fact of the fact that this is fun and a gift and a, and a, and a joyful endeavor. So I think it's the balance. I always think it's the balance. The anti-bullying thing was a program that I that I was a part of in in my high school studies. Oh, oh yeah, uh, please, please. As, yeah. As, as well, it was called Faces Theater Network for Teens, and it was amazing. It was it was a it was an after school program that took students who of all ages who were searching for like help outside of challenging situations inside and outside the house, inside and outside school, they would bring in those frustrations, those issues, those, um, those high emotions. And we created like almost like improv therapy where we would get to sort of just bounce back the scenes of our life and what we wish we had said in those moments to each other and create sort of scenes. And, and yeah, it was really amazing. And it, it was, and then we would take those scenes that of, of what is happening in our real life, theatricalize them and bring them to schools all around New York City. Oh, and, wow. And then create a conversation about like, hey, wh what are things that are harmful that we are doing to each other that we can better? And sometimes like, you know, you'd bring your show to a school and, you know, it was still high school. So like, there would be bullies in the audience being like, beat them up yeah. <laughs> right oh, no. and, and then <laughs> and then but then what was amazing is and this is why theater is the best it is a community-based art form you would have other people being like shut up i'm watching the show right and suddenly the power of the bully was subverted. not existent and yeah. it was subverted because we were all doing something so much m more than 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 belittling. So I, yeah, I just I I really love that, and I think that sort of prime that that was a, that has been a primer my entire life. Peer mediation, theater therapy, communication that has been a primer in what I hope every process I've ever been a part of, and I can sort of sense when communication needs to be stronger or like when things can feel potentially toxic in the environment and. I'm not perfect, but the awareness of it is so primed. And that's been a, a major mode of my collaborations and what I hope I am inside a rehearsal process. And yeah, so I'm very, I'm very grateful for, for that. I'm very grateful for it at a young age where my mind is still moldable. 
And it just kind of stumbled into my life. And I, I, it was my college essay. And the program doesn't exist anymore now, unfortunately, because it was sponsored by Maimonides Hospital. And a lot of that funding, obviously, for the arts, that's the first right. thing to go. But I do, find it, I do find it really important to bring that forward in, in everything that I do. Hey, this is Jason, and we'll get right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that Page and Stage is way more than this podcast. If you go check out pageandstage.art, that's pageandstage.art, you'll find a weekly newsletter full of tips, tricks, encouragement, and inspiration for storytellers of all stripes. You'll also find the online bookshop for Ibis Books, which is the publishing wing of Page and Stage. And if you are working on your play, novel, memoir, or speech, you can even set up some one-on-one -on -one story coaching with me. Again, that's pageandstage.art. And now back to my conversation with Harris and Brian. Harrison, you and I met doing Hand to God at Florida Studio Theater. And I actually had Brenny Campbell on here just a couple episodes ago, and we waxed poetic about this show. It's clearly a show that was very special to the entire team. Every show is important in our careers, but there's always those handful that kind of stick out as like, oh, I would take that ride again right now. So I want to use Hand to God to kind of get into your puppetry and into all the different things that happened in that show and how you and I worked together. Because I don't even know if you remember this story or not, but the way you and I first started working together was a lot of fun too. Let's start with how you got into puppetry in the first place. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Puppet, puppet, puppets. So I, I you know, my mom, my mom, sh shared with me very recently, like last week, a picture she, she found, this is crazy. She found an essay that she had written that was published by a children's magazine before I was even born that was talking about the magic of puppetry. Whoa. And so inside the womb, this was already <laughs> being, it, it, I was already absorbing my mom's love for puppetry because she, uh, she was a lover of young education. She was a lover of theater and the arts. And she brought puppetry into her classrooms mm -hmm. as like a teaching tool for children. And obviously we know from all of the history of puppetry that it is an incredible teaching tool and that children, especially children, can relate to puppets in a way that they, they do not necessarily relate to their adults or their peers. So I think I was definitely introduced at a young But it, when I was 11 years old, I was taken to Broadway to see Avenue Q. And my parents <laughs> had pretty much no idea what they were taking their 11 year old child I was gonna to. Say, that's, that, that's pretty intense <laughs> for an 11 year old. It's puppets, they had but no it, idea. No, it's R rated puppets. <laughs> they had no idea. But it blew my mind. It immediately became my favorite piece of theater I've ever seen. And um, the first time that I had witnessed the puppeteer with the puppet. That, right. That puppet was... here is not hidden like in Muppets or like a lot of the school or church shows where the puppet just is above a curtain and you don't see the puppeteer. The puppeteer is in relationship with the yes. puppet, their own puppet, the other puppets. Everyone is there together. And that the, the theatrical conceit of yeah. the puppet and the puppeteer are one entity, that was magical to me. And it is, for me, the core of theater that we are presenting something that is not actually happening and we are all buying in and believing in the magic together and seeing something that is not alive become alive. It is magic. It is God. It is... So puppets to me are the physical manifestation of our imagination. We are believing something to be true because we believe it's true. Yeah. So it, because that is so profound to me, <laughs> I have to have it in my life. And yeah. so I just decided at a certain point to become healthily obsessed with puppets. And, um, <laughs> and I self-taught myself. I watched, I would for like a year, watch every YouTube tutorial I could find wow. on how to be a puppeteer. There's just not a ton of like puppet schools. Like there's not like a ton of like puppet training programs on how to puppeteer. They exist, but like the mainstream puppet world is just Sesame Street. Like yeah. it, there's, and then, and then you have to get like really fringy about it. You got to look to like Europe for like all these fringy European puppet companies. 
you know, like, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. there's not that much. So in terms of like training and education, it's for me, it was a lot of self stuff. So I was watching every, everything I could find. And then what happens is you tell someone that you, you, you know, you do puppetry and then they're like, great, I need a puppeteer. And then I was lucky enough to be cast in a show off Broadway with a bunch of puppeteers. I was cast in a NYU thesis with a bunch of like puppets on film work. And I'm just full sponge. I'm in full sponge mode. I am asking every question to every professional puppeteer. Talk to me about breathing, technique, voice manipulation, lip sync, eye focus. Like there is so much incredible technical craft that goes into it. So I then became obsessed with the craft and the technique because um, it is a form of physical comedy and clowning, but just in your hand. I just became sort of in love with that. And what I found is that like, so much of the work for puppeteers is children entertainment based and that because of because of avenue q my love for puppeteers and and puppets were was not children entertainment based it was right. subversive it was yeah. it was like it was sinister with a charm super um, edgy yeah edgy like it's i love the idea that puppets can speak to adults because they're speaking to our inner child Mm -hmm. That is some deep seated stuff that I want to get into. <laughs> and so, yeah, so then, so that's sort of like my journey with puppeteering. And I'm very happy to have it in the arsenal. And it's, uh, it's like how it speaks to me as a physical comedian and, and how it yeah. speaks to me as a theater maker. I'm always looking to, it's so theatrical. It's inherently theatrical. So it's yeah. like, I want to try and insert puppetry in everything that I can. And yeah. whether that's <laughs> hand puppetry or the shadow puppetry, it's animation. It's, it's all of it. Um, and so then obviously when I saw Hand to God, you know, I saw that play in New York three different times in three different theaters. I, I was the, it's the play that I'm so mad I didn't write myself. Um, <laughs> Because it's everything that I want a piece of theater to be. And, and I, I'm in love with the, the sense of humor of it and the darkness of it and the depth, the emotional depth of that show is just brilliant. And so, yes, yeah, so many kudos to Rob Askins for, for brainchilding that and kudos to the Ensemble Studio Theater and MCC. The uh, fact that that, sh that that little show that could made it to Broadway and, and now has made an impact in so many of these regional theaters who are brave enough, yes, Jason, yes. brave enough to yeah. put on this show and risk alienating their audience. I think the people who will stand by this piece, I think really understand something on a deep, deep level about what it means to be a theater artist and what it means to challenge ourselves. And that show is such a challenge. It is Hamlet for puppeteers. I mean, it is, it is so great. So I'm so blessed to have that opportunity. I'm very curious to hear your perspective on our process in that, because for oh, me, yeah. it was such a fever dream and it that's, was that's my point harrison yeah constant. i was going to ask you to set you up is you saw it you were desperate to do that show for how long oh i mean i i was emailing people like a madman for at least a year <laughs> and a half anytime i got a google alert to hand to god i was like you need me in this show <laughs> <laughs> and you were my you were my excalibur i mean like you know someone was willing to help me pull this sword out of the stone so <laughs> You got the call from FST saying you got the role. What happened to you? Like, what did your apartment survive? Did I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I left. I left that audition, and I get. I gave it. I gave a thousand percent of myself in that audition, and I left that audition. And to to be honest, I kind of knew at risk of feeling. Uh, it's not about that. I, in my soul, I was like, this is the opportunity. This right. is the opportunity. I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to audition for this again. And I was so present and connected with that puppet in that room and with all of you in the space. I guess if I, if I hadn't got it and I still felt that, it, like, it didn't matter. Like, that's what I mean. Like, it didn't matter whether I got it or not. Like, getting the call was a beautiful moment. And I remember I was on the porch with my mom and we'd hugged each other. So it was like actually like, a, it was actually quite a touching moment. Very like, beautiful, I really, yeah. really, really wanted it. And, for, and as an actor to really want something and then get it, it's rare and, and beautiful. Super so, rare. So, so uh, and, and very often you'll be like, oh, I, that audition sucked. And then you'll get it and you'll be like, I don't know who I am anymore. But right. um, so it wasn't about like, I got it. It was just like, in my soul, I got it. I understood what it was like to play this role, even just yeah. for those five minutes. And it felt amazing. And so regardless of whether I got the call, I was like, my soul is full 
my soul is full and I, and I, and I was doing it. I was really doing it with a puppet that I had made myself. Yeah. So yeah. it was so meta and, 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 and yeah, it was just, it was fulfilling. It was just so fulfilling. So, um, yeah, my, my house survived. My heart, <laughs> my heart grew three times that night. That day, right? Um, so on my end, I got uh, round, I got your video. It was you and, and we'll talk about understudy Tyrone more later too, but it was just you and your homemade, handmade puppet doing the scene on your couch. And I watched the video and I'd seen so many by this point too. And I, and I, I literally walked into Richard Hopkins' office and said, I got our guy. This will be the guy. I know we still have callbacks, but put him at the top of your list. When he comes in, just open your eyes a little wider. But I, I literally said to my AD, and this, again, as a director, <laughs> this is not what you're supposed to do. I was, like, I was like, this is our floor. If anyone comes in and blows him away, great. Yay us. But that's not going to happen. Very nice of you to say. So but then, this is what's fun. I don't, I don't know if you told, I don't know if you remember telling me this, but it was about a week or two into rehearsal, and we were. You pulled me aside. We were just chatting, and you said something that stuck with me, Jason. I came into this wanting to do this show so bad, and I knew exactly how I wanted it to go in my head. I, ha you were almost pre-directed. You had the show done upon arrival, and ha having seen your video, I sort of intuited that, and so I knew that my first few days with you were going to be earning your trust. Mm. I'm going back to you, the very first thing you were talking about with collaboration, right? Yeah. You arrived so hot and so ready, but there's four other actors in this show. And we're doing this on a little black box stage, not a Broadway stage or even a regional. It's a little black box stage and it's a super stripped down aesthetic. You don't get to come out in a real car, right? You're going to stand there next to your mom with an invisible steering wheel and maybe some sound effects, <laughs> right? You don't get a whole bed or a bedroom. You get a beanbag center stage that your expectations upon arrival mm. were X, Y, Z. I knew that our show was going to be ABC. <laughs> and I knew that once we started working together, it was probably going to be more like MNO, <laughs> right? That's what the wow. final landing place would be. But I knew that it was going to take time for you just to trust that everyone else cared about it as much as you did and to find ways to let Brenny in to let Drew change your choice in that moment, to let Tom show you something better for this scene, to let, you know, you know what I'm saying, Harrison? And I think it was around yeah. week one and a half, two, where you expressed something similar to me that, Jason, I came in and I, I thought I was going to have to like teach you how to do this show, but thank you so much for helping me be even better or something like that. I'm totally misquoting yeah. you, but no, that was the idea. No, yeah, that is coming back to me. And again, like my, my memory of this is, is almost so schizo because I was, I was so in it I, and I was so, so hard into it. Oh man. And I really was, there was a lot of self-direction because I would film every rehearsal and I would study it. I would study it like an athlete, like looking at every single angle and making sure that the puppet was communicating properly. And I think the thing that you really exposed in me, and this is some weird fate stuff because the character's name is Jason. Jason. Right. <laughs> right? And so like, and like, I was so obsessed with how to bring the puppet to life that I had completely abandoned the 50% other responsibility of this incredible role, which is the yeah. human inside of it. And that's Jason. And you're talking about like the readiness to like dive in and know exactly how it was. But I was only doing that for half of my mind. And so, yeah, I remember... I remember that conversation because it was about uncovering the, it was about uncovering the truth of everything I didn't know. And I was so certain going into that process that I know this play backwards and forwards. Like I know exactly who this person is, but I was just focused on half of it. And the other half was the, was being in the room with the people in the, in the space. And you were so giving with letting the puppet have its own life that that just like took over my my brain and so it was about finding the it took and so finding the human and finding the jason underneath right hilarious if you name this episode finding the jason with Harrison finding Bryant. the jason that's it no, <laughs> i'm gonna write that down that's not bad i always give it a to an episode but yeah i really really had to find the jason there and once i did the contrast between the two characters was able to live and that's the tension of the play. That's the mystery of it. And I, that wasn't clear to me. And it was a huge lesson in, I'm not going to say over prep, because I think preparation is everything. Yeah. But if your preparation doesn't leave room for discovery, yes, it is a trap. Yep. And that is tremendous. And that, with the multi-hyphenate thing in mind, is 
all of it, right? Like you can't, you cannot, I, I, I hate the word, I hate to say you cannot in any sentence because life <laughs> is limitless. Right. But I feel like I have learned time and time again that the more expectation I bring into the room, the harder it is to truthfully discover and collaborate effectively. I wrote down MNO because you're right. Like I, that is exactly it. Like a play comes to life when my ABC and your XYZ meet to form something that both of us had no idea was possible. Yeah. And that really happened with Hand to God. I remember I was, I was kind of bummed that first day of rehearsal hearing about the scaled down aesthetic. I was like, I was like, but, but, the, but the play is like, the, but the play, like, these stage directions are perfect. Like, like what, what do you mean? Like, like, I have to be in a bed. I practice in a bed. The circumference of the beanbag will change the angle of my right arm. Like, it was like, obviously, I, I, and that's just, that is, that is a younger Harrison not um, embracing the, um, the brilliance of shaking it up. Like, yeah. um, like letting the shakeup be an opportunity, not an obstacle. Yes. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. So uh, I, I love, I love, I love that play. And I loved our experience. And I only wish that we had more time and more yeah. performances because Could have run forever. my God, that audience just had no idea what to do with that show. And oh, like, it man. was so the funny. Audiences got on the ride so quick and some just yeah. did not know what to do. Some walked it, out. It was amazing. <laughs> it was such a social experiment of, yeah. of, and it's exactly like what y'all are trying to do in that black box space where it's just like, we're challenging the audience to meet us wherever this play is at this yeah. time. And sometimes the audience is like, those were some of the loudest, longest laugh applause breaks of any show I've ever been in. And at the same performance, people walked out. Like, how do you have that? How do you have that polarity and experience in the same play? And it's like only in that play because it's just yeah. doing things on so many levels. It's always surprising. <laughs> when, I, when I was talking to Brenny, she mentioned how in rehearsal, it felt like she was opposite two actors with you and Tyrone, that you were so yeah. deep into that and so of two minds and reacting and channel changing so fast without even thought past, mm -hmm. past the point of thinking about it, that she talked about the Tyrone being so present. My experience of that was, and I, I'm sure you remember this too, is that we uh, brought you and Tyrone up on stage for an improv encore. So yes. it, was, it was me and Will Luera, who was a guest on this podcast back in episode one, and you and Tyrone improvising. And I'll tell you what, Harrison, this goes to what you were saying earlier. And even on your website, you say something about how in theater, it's the safest place to be unsafe. I have never in my life on stage felt that completely unsafe in the best way possible because the puppet can say and do anything. Right. Humans, we yeah. think we can, right? Uh, no, there's limitate. We there's certain things we cannot say and do on stage. There are certain lines we cannot cross, period. But the puppet has zero shackles of any kind. And Will and I, I remember him and I just looking at each other and then look and there were times when the puppet would do something and Harrison would go, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. That you were catching and trying to censor Tyrone and Tyrone wasn't having it. And it was one of the most exhilarating terrifying like seven minutes <laughs> that yeah. i have ever gone through but that that wow. line about the safest place to be unsafe i think this play yes. and puppetry is all it all ties into that same idea that in rehearsal is supposed to be a place where you fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and oh there it is mm. and reveal yes. and reveal and dig and dig and hurt and feel and find it oh that will help the audience right it's just it's that nonstop process of putting yourself into the most unsafe positions possible to because discover the thing that will make the audience have their cathartic moment. We have to be okay with failing. We have to. Like, we have to embrace that as part of the process. And I hope to exist inside spaces where that is welcomed and encouraged. And you're right, like that puppet, I mean, Tyrone especially. And I feel like I'm not like, <laughs> I don't I certainly don't lead with my improv training. I don't part right. I haven't had enough improv experience to really be like, I can hold myself in a in an improv setting. But that puppet just unlocked the a certain improviser. <laughs> it, it just unlocked a freedom in me that I I want to bring to every performance because you're right. Like he was so unfiltered, so impulsive. 
the inhibitions are so lowered because I, yeah. as a human, am protected by this mask. You know, I think I, yep. I think I referred to it as a clown earlier, like a clown for your yeah. hand, but like the mask of the puppet as a protective device over the human insecurities is why children feel more comfortable talking to puppets. It's Mr. why Rogers, we, right? Mr. Rogers was that's right, genius at that, genius. At we that. we implicitly trust puppets more than ourselves. And that is the most fun thing in the world to subvert. So like in an improv setting, yeah, that puppet can do anything. <laughs> and inside the show, which is a scripted production, that puppet, I mean, bless your heart, you encouraged a freedom in Tyrone's performance. I think even in rehearsal, there were moments where you were giving notes to Tyrone. And that just allowed me. It was to... the easiest way to. It was the easiest way to talk about it. To like say, "Hey, Harrison, when you're," it was just. It was so much easier just to direct as though I had six actors. It made <laughs> yeah. it so much easier, right? I, yes. Otherwise, it was going to be nonstop qualification or yes. Uh, anyway, yeah, and yeah. and it just yeah, it really allowed that divide to exist, and that's why I felt so exposed when I didn't have Tyrone on stage because I was like, I, I don't know what to do myself right now. And oh, wow. in terms of the, in terms of the person coding, it actually revealed itself to be more about listening than speaking. I, as Jason and finding Jason, I had right. to <laughs> actively listen while my hand was talking. And if my body language wasn't actively listening, I died. Yeah. And it's much easier to tell when the puppet dies because it stops moving. Right, right, or it goes limp, or right, or it goes know. limp, and you're like, oh, so my hand isolation as a practice throughout, and making sure that I had breath in my right hand at all times, that's actually pretty easy to sustain. That is yeah. just a practice muscle memory. But being able to actively listen while you're talking is not a human practice. It, yeah. It's just, it's yeah. not. It, like when I'm talking to you, my energy is a, is is exerted. But when I'm listening to you, I'm inhaling your words. How do you talk and listen at the same time? It's That's like Kenny, a magic. Kenny G playing the saxophone on a circular breathing. <laughs> right. <laughs> like a note it on is, a transatlantic flight. <laughs> it is not human. So what I did, and this is where I started. Remember, I was filming all of these rehearsals to watch yep. the puppet. Yep. I stopped watching the puppet in my uh, playbacks. Uh, and I started watching myself. And any time oh. I wasn't actively listening, I circled that. And in rehearsal the next day, I became more aware. Because Tyrone, like you said, was like pretty much self-directed going into that rehearsal process. So I was on muscle memory on that. And I was able to change it and adapt what other actors were giving and the circumstances. But me listening while I was talking is huge. And I have actually, that has changed me as an actor. And maybe as a person too. It would have to. Like, yeah. Like how I listen on stage is so different because of that experience. And it is so much more physical. It is engaged. It is active. And I like I cannot go backwards. Like as, a, as an actor, I cannot. And so that totally changed the world. It changed the world for me. So your biggest new thing coming up is, uh, and you've been working on this for a while. So I'm just going to kind of give you the runway here, Harrison, because I know you've got a story here, but you have a world premiere of a new musical called A Hanukkah Carol or Gelt Trip, the musical, puns galore. Um, <laughs> but talk about where Hanukkah Carol came from, what you've gone through. For any other aspiring storytellers of all stripes out there, there's so many steps. To your point of being a multi-hyphenate, I mean, you've basically used every hat you own in the development of this piece. So just yeah. what's the story here of Hanukkah Carol? Yeah, oh my goodness. When I was growing up, my, my mom and dad had my sister and I believing in the Hanukkah fairy, which is uh, <laughs> essentially some kind of Hanukkah fairy comes into the house and decorates the house all in blue and white and leaves presents under the table. And, you know, we leave latkes out for the Hanukkah fairy. I mean, it's it's so it sounds so absurd. Um, but when you compare it to Santa and Christmas, you're like, huh. <laughs> Same levels of insanity, huh. right? <laughs> you know. It's just less people are believing in the Hanukkah fairy. In fact, no one except my family. And so that has always been sort of a, a deep part of my soul. It wasn't until I was literally like nine or ten where I was like, "It's it's the parents." And then 
I wasn't like mad about it. I was like, this is impressive. Mom and dad like went hard for this. Good job, y'all. And so um, fast forward, I don't know, 26 years <laughs> into the future. And I'm commissioned to write a 10 minute Hanukkah play for a 24 hour play festival. It was a holiday themed event and they wanted Hanukkah to be represented in this sea of Christmas <laughs> shows. And so I was commissioned to, to write a little and we were sitting around the table eating Bubby's Baked Ziti and we were kicking around ideas because you only have, you know, you only have eight hours in a 24 hour play festival environment. You have about eight hours to write the play and then it's handed over to the director who casts it. They freaking produce it and it perform it that night. And so we were kicking around ideas. And it came up, there was like, has there ever been a Hanukkah version of Dickens' Christmas Carol? Mm. I did a Google search, and believe it or not, it's not even like a like an SNL sketch. Like, no one has done, like, no one has done this. Crazy. It's like right there in Mel it's Brooks. Kind of yeah, it's like kind of shocking. Nothing, you know? And so I was like, oh my God, perfect. So similar to like Scrooge being haunted by the spirits of Christmas, I was haunted that night by the spirits of Hanukkah put something together real quick. I replaced an old man and replaced it with like a, like a little, like she was a, she was a stoner girl from Long Island. She didn't want to go home to, she didn't want to go home to Long Island. So right, huh? And <laughs> she got a little too high on some kosher kush and she was visited by the spirits of Hanukkah, one of which was the Hanukkah fairy, right? Oh my um, goodness. And so anyway, that 10 minute play was performed that night in front of my family. And instantly became my favorite thing I've ever written. It, it was like every line got a laugh. It was absurd. And it felt like we had stumbled upon a new holiday tradition that we didn't know we needed. And people were like, you should make it longer. You should, like that. This, this could be a full thing. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I sat on that idea. A couple of months later, I was emailed by a writing team from the BMI Writers Program. And that's oh, like- wow. um, that's like a, that's like a, it's like a musical theater lore of like, ironically, Avenue Q, the writers of Avenue Q guest teach at this program all the time. Like wow. it is, it is where a lot of new musicals get developed. A lot of great musical writing teams meet. And I was asked by a composer friend of mine who I had worked on with a puppet project at NYU. And he was like, Hey, my writing partner is looking for a book writer for a new musical we don't have any ideas and I know you write. Do you have any plays of yours that maybe could be adapted into a musical? We'd be interested in looking through some material. And I sent him, Jason, I sent him an email with like 25 PDFs of 10 minute plays, feature plays, sketches. It was absolutely like a crazy email to send. And I was like, I'm going to send you everything I have. What do you think could be a musical? And at the time, a Hanukkah carol really jumped out of, and at the time it was called a Hanukkah carol or a Hanukkah carol or a Chanaka carol or a Hanukkah, <laughs> like it was, it, it was 16 different ways to right. spell it. So I used all of them in the title and they were like, we'll have to pick a spelling, but we think this could be a musical. And I had always dreamed about writing a musical. Like I grew up in Brooklyn. I was going to Broadway musicals when I was like four years old. I'd been in musicals. Like I, I love the absurdity and the insanity of, of a musical, like talking about like puppetry too, right? Like we are going to, we are going to really buy into the, these people breaking out the song. I just love how silly it is. And so I've always wanted to write a musical. And when they were like a Hanukkah Carol could be musical, I was like, oh my God, yes, let's do it. Let's freaking do it. And then it became a process of like, how do you, how do you take a 10 minute play and turn it into a full length musical? <laughs> yeah. We really had to go in and see what we loved about the, what I essentially wrote was a 10 minute sketch. and then expand from there and we found a lot of heart in doing that and at the time remember she was smoking kosher kush and right. that's what forged this the spirits and we wrote a full r-rated version where that was still the case and we then presented that in a reading with a couple producers and the feedback we were given is this is really funny but your audience is so niche and limited uh. what would happen as an experiment, if we took out the drug use and the curse words. And I was like, you know, like, you know, my, my love, my sense of humor, my South Park, like all of that was like at play. And I was like, as an experiment, let's do it. And one of the smartest notes we've ever gotten, because what happened is we were able to keep all of the humor and the joy, but add real holiday magic to it. And suddenly our sort of like reefer madness meets Christmas Carol became, oh, just another Christmas Carol. 
And A Christmas Carol is so popular, not because yeah. it's like good, but because it speaks it it speaks to like the heart of of why we love family and why community is important and why we gather every December whatever to celebrate life. And suddenly this show had that, but it also had something even um, more pressing, and that is the celebration of your identity inside an overwhelming majority that you do not necessarily fit inside of. Yeah. And as a as a Jewish person who has celebrated Hanukkah my whole life, whose parents had to make up a Hanukkah fairy so that I felt like every year in December I had something to be proud of and celebrate yeah. alongside my Christmas celebrating friends. The fact that our piece speaks to the heart of wanting to feel included and then celebrating what it is that actually makes us unique and special is a layer that Dickens simply does not have. Mm -hmm. On top of that, we have a comedic sensibility, which I find that Christmas Carol often lacks. It's like, except for the Muppet Christmas Carol and maybe like Mickey Mouse's <laughs> Christmas Carol, right? It's like, we're not laughing for most of this show. In fact, yeah. it's a ghost story question mark. We're supposed to be scared. And it's like, actually, I want people laughing on every single page. And then I want them to be like crying and having like a heartfelt emotional moment that they were surprised by yeah. because of this added level of identity and of inclusion. And I think we've really captured something potentially super special. And so now the challenge of like, okay, so we've written something that's like really super special. We have like, I don't know, 14 original songs, which wow. is like, which is um 14 times more Hanukkah songs than exists on this planet. <laughs> that already exists, oh. right? <laughs> <laughs> Triple the Hanukkah backlist right there. <laughs> right, right, right. So we have something super unique and it's like, oh man, what do we do with it? And we were like, let's put on, um, let's put on our industry reading and we'll do that and it's 2020 and we're like ready to do that and then the oh, pandemic right, right? Yep. and so now we're like what do we do dang so we had all this momentum we had ideas and stuff and we were like well let's create something anyway so we created an animated trailer we've hired a, a company on the philippines on a, a site called upwork which is like a freelance site where we can meet upwork anyone around off. the world Damn. Upwork's so awesome so we met this filipino company and the animation artist had never even heard of Hanukkah. Hanukkah was like, can you tell me about Hanukkah? And it's like, and it's like, okay. And so we create a two minute animated teaser trailer. And suddenly uh, this comes out and we're getting like 100,000 views on TikTok, whatever. And it's like, people are like, when's the movie coming out? And we're like, oh, did we just... <laughs> Did we just oh, accidentally? No. <laughs> did we just accidentally <laughs> promise an animated movie musical to our <laughs> thousands of fans that don't even know what this thing is? And it's like, wow, we are potentially sitting on not only this full length musical, but also this animated movie musical that is going to fill a gap of yeah. Hanukkah content that is comedic and delightful and can exist every year. We then, so then multiple hats, multiple hats are happening, right? Yeah. And the pandemic happening, I send this trailer to the artistic director of Roundhouse Theater, company that I did, A Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, where I performed their Helen Hayes nominated production. And I'm just sending this trailer to every theater I've ever worked at and being like, I don't know what your December, I don't know what theater is anymore, right? What is theater? <laughs> we're in the pandemic. I don't know when everyone's going to come back. But like, we have this show that we're really excited about, you know, would you be interested in potentially taking your holiday slot and inserting a Hanukkah carol in? No one's ever done it. No one has ever done it. Roundhouse Theater came back and they were like, we are interested. Our slot currently um, is taken up this year, but like, let, let's maybe look at it in for the future. A week later, the slot that they had, that production dropped out and they're like, we need a holiday show ASAP. So now. Script right now. <laughs> and it was like, okay, so I'm going to send you the script. I'm going to send you the score. Ryan Roulette, who's the artistic director there, shared it with his whole office. They loved it. They're like, we want to do it this year. Fast forward to the end of that year. It is very challenging to put on a musical and yeah. regional theaters all around the country right now are dealing with a drop in subscribers a drop in government support from their usual grant money and the money that they they obviously thought they had, it became really challenging. And also time crunch, right? We were trying to fit yeah. in a whole new musical in a short yeah. amount of time. So it was agreed upon from all parties to remove the show from that season. That was 2020 now three. We were going to do it uh, last year even. That was removed and we were left with like a whole year. Because of the nature of a seasonal show, it can yeah. only be done in that right. six to eight weeks. But you're set up for this year, 
right? Yeah. So this is so this is where it gets crazy because that week we were not going to submit for this, but there was a, an opportunity called Open Jars Shark Tank, where you uh, pitch your musical to Broadway producers as oh like a Shark God. Tank venture. Oh and we God. already had a production lined up. We weren't going to submit to this at all. Like right. We were like set. But then this production got like canceled and we were like, well, let's just submit anyway. They, out of like 400 submissions, one of six shows. Oh, we are wow. Harris. We end up pitching this show to these incredible producers and we are voted as like the audience favorite. So now we've got this like audience favorite Broadway Shark Tank for something that we should. So again, it's like the obstacle became the opportunity. Yes. Uh, so then that happened. Roundhouse Theater came back. They were like, hey, we heard about your Shark Tank win. That's amazing. Finances are looking great this year. We are super <laughs> committed to this show. Let's do it in 2024. We're going to give you an extra week of tech. We're going to give you two extra weeks of performances. Wow. And so suddenly now this like, and we also now have the encouragement and support of these Broadway producers who saw us at Shark Tank, now coupled with this great regional theater who wants to do this world premiere. And the show I can now say is like, is absolutely happening <laughs> in November of 2024. We're putting it out uh. in this world. It's going to run for six weeks to the end of the year. And that um, we hope can then get transferred and brought to New York yep. um, for the next holiday season. And then really the dream, Jason, is that this show can, with many, as many Christmas carols do, happen every single year every in year. many communities around the country, maybe even the world. And then eventually, yeah, get adapted into that animated into movie, the movie because <laughs> people are asking for it. Or like, well, I have to Harrison, Harrison, you mentioned the Muppet Christmas Carol. The puppet version of Hanukkah Carol. Oh, Come on now. Oh. <laughs> I said, <laughs> well, I mean, obviously there's a puppet in a Hanukkah Carol. Instead I just of got going... myself another producer credit, right? Am I? Am yes. I oh, yeah. I'm putting it in. <laughs> um, so instead of Tiny Tim, because like having like a, a, a sad crippled boy does not belong in a musical right. comedy, I think. So we went with uh, Kitty Tim, who is a dying cat on their ninth life. Oh, and geez. and this cat is like really struggling to get through this show. And uh, she has to rediscover her love for Hanukkah, obviously. And how that impacts Kitty Tim is is a spoiler I will not give here on this podcast. But that is a puppet, we believe. And so that's going to be. Yeah, that's that's just one of the many charming, fun differences in Hanukkah Carol. That was a journey. I just spilled a lot onto you there. But I that's just wanted to I wanted to sort of articulate, like, for me, the main thing. And maybe you can play back that whole journey in like three times speed so people can <laughs> people can, can hear the journey but not have to sit through it all but I, like i did over the course of four or five years five now years, what yeah. i just gave you in 10 minutes or so yeah. but like the main thing that i've discovered in terms of really pursuing a commercially targeted theatrical venture right now in this climate of producing theater is like there is so many moments i mean three or four years of this has just been self-producing self-developing, writing nonstop, performing it ourselves if we have to, asking a million favors from a million beautiful people, a crowdfund campaign, right? Where we had to, we raised $35,000 by begging friends and constantly bombarding in emails and texts and Facebook and Instagram. I mean, like it is such, I mean, we use the word hustle a lot, but this is a hustle. And ultimately the thing that got me through it we are now we feel so lucky to have the support that we have and the theater willing to do it and talking to licensing companies and a, a promise and a hope for a future but like it all starts with really really trusting yourself and the reason for the show to exist and not stopping like just so many i don't even think i even got into like some of the other hurdles that we went through but like there are so many moments in this process leading up to this year that have been like it's just not in the cards. It's just not happening. And yeah. you get so many no's. But as long as the, the, the inner artist in myself is saying yes, and the collaborators that you surround yourself with are saying yes, it's cliched where it's like, you know, believe in yourself. But like, that is it. That is what we have at the end of the day. It's that belief in ourselves as creatives to continue in spite the obstacles, that every obstacle is truly an opportunity, that really buying into that philosophy has created this opportunity. I really think that's true. Great, Harrison. We're just going to wrap up here with a yeah, couple please. pieces of advice and a spotlight. 
What is the best advice that you have ever taken? Yeah, I've taken a lot of notes in my life. I love, I'm a big note taker. Um, You're an actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a big note taker. Um, and I love notes. In fact, if I'm in a rehearsal process and the director doesn't give me notes, I'm like, they're not watching hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> note to director. I just gave all directors a note. But Every uh, director listening, give notes. Yes, give notes. <laughs> well, I welcome them. I love them. I think one that really speaks to me is an, is an ad advice on auditioning that I wanted to share, I think. And that's that, like, obviously, like, prep is important. And walking into a room with confidence and your prep and strong choices and ideas is huge. But the thing that I was told my senior year by Mary Buck, who was a, an amazing casting director and TV and film for many, many years, she said that what I need to walk into the room with is gratitude. And that um, before I walk into any room, and whether it's an audition room, a rehearsal room, a stage, a writing room, I mean, literally wherever I'm walking, a Zoom room, like wherever I'm walking in, what am I grateful for about this opportunity? What am I grateful for in my life? Who am I grateful for in my life? Walking in with that energy can be felt so much more on the other side of the table than any amount of prep work. I don't need to show you how much work I put into this. I need to show myself that I'm grateful for this experience. And when I'm walking in with that energy, the room changes. And it changes for the other people, but it also changes for me. And that was like a huge piece of advice that is certainly, um, I, I really try and I think about that a lot. I think that could apply to pretty much any any situation, any job, any profession, any that, that gratitude practice sets It's a meditation. Yeah. 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 It's a meditation for sure. It is it is a um it is a space to return to whenever the stress feels too high. Um I I often do like gratitude meditation mantra work like that cuz it, it it can very often feel life and death all the time in this right. work in this right. and again art is personal, right? So yeah. it's it's hard to say it's a business because it's it's my business. I am the yeah. business. I am yeah. what I I can only bring in what I am. Harrison and Bryant so, Inc. Yeah. 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 And so, so yeah, I think just slowing things down and feeling just, just gratitude and, and projecting that is, has been really useful. Flip it. What is the worst advice that you've ever given? I had to text a few people for this. There were a couple <laughs> people. I had, I, there was nothing that, like, I've been practicing mindfulness for a few years now, like in, in a very uh, daily practice kind of way. And um, I was recently married. I got I got married about a, That's a, right. a, a little less than two off. years ago. So I, I went to my wife and I was like, is there any bad advice I've been I've given you over our many years of dating and, and existing together? And she's like, let me sleep on that. And then I, I ironically, uh, one of my one of my best friends and my collaborator, Brandon Zellman, said, yeah, I, I know exactly what the worst advice you've ever given me is. And that, that's uh, you don't need sleep. <laughs> I think I am. I'm so obsessed with time management and and being productive. And right. I think a lot of that comes with, you know, maybe some OCD or maybe just like the need to make that I've, I've often dismissed sleep as part of my narrative of being a human being. But I've learned actually that sleep is a necessity and you need to take hmm. care of yourself and, and your health is, is, is really important. <laughs> and that sleep and resting is a, is a natural part of gaining health. And so I have now recharged that. I, I think you can oversleep for sure, but I think we need sleep and we should, we should not be telling people not to sleep. So, <laughs> for all the people who I've said that to, I apologize, including my wife. I love you. Oh, she's there. How wonderful. Yeah, she just walked in. I, I, I think she just woke up, which is even funnier <laughs> in, 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 that, in that. People tracking, it was 12.30 p.m. <laughs> Harrison, thank you so much. I just want to uh, give you a little last minute here to tell us, tell all the listeners how to how to learn more? Where can they find you? Where can they follow oh you? If, they, if they're in, what they're in the right city? What show of yours should they come see? Just let us know what's going on. Yeah. So you know, I've got a website, harrisonbryan.com. You can find me on Instagram at haha Harrison Bryan. We'll throw out a couple of other things. You can certainly find out more about a Hanukkah Carol at a Hanukkah Carol .com or at a Hanukkah Carol. Uh, which at spelling? Sure, sure. <laughs> it's actually we went with how the iPhone auto spells. Automatically auto corrects. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. Actually, a brilliant move. <laughs> <laughs> so it's H A N U K K A H Carol C A R 
capital L. And yeah, I would say like those are all my main stuffs. Oh, of course, you can follow at understudy Tyrone. Oh, yes, for, please do. For more sock <laughs> puppet nastiness, if that comes into play. I'm also working on another musical called Balls. Find that at, at Balls Musical. It's a satire of the Pokemon universe. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. But if you're a gamer and a nerd, come find us at Balls. <laughs> You'll have a good time. But no, I'm, I'm generally around too. Like I love cold emails and cold messages. I've got a contact me section on the website. So I love when people just shoot me random messages and I answer everything. So hit me up. Harrison, thank you so much for the time today and best of luck with all of these projects. Uh, you're awesome, Jason. It's so good to see you. You've been listening to the Page and Stage podcast. All my thanks to this week's guest and to all of you out there for listening. You can learn more about all my guests and access their websites, links, and upcoming projects in the episode summaries. And you can become a backer of this podcast by clicking support over at pageandstage.art. Send me your thoughts and questions at jason at pageandstage.art. I always love to hear from you, and I'll be featuring your questions on future episodes. This podcast is built with Alitu, the all-in-one online podcasting app created by Colin and his amazing team over at thepodcasthost.com. Thank you again for listening, and until next time, I'm Jason Cannon, and I cannot wait to hear your stories.